But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Is that word troubled or anxiety? That's something that, that I think only 90% of Americans deal with today. Some level of anxiousness that you anxiety. But he says here that we should not suffer for righteousness. If you are, then you are you are blessed. Now that doesn't make sense. How can I be happy when I'm suffering? That's that concept here. And Satan uses that against us. And we'll look at that a little bit. He says, do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled by the threats, but do what? How can I, okay, God, you tell me this is what I need to do. So how can I achieve that? Okay? And that's really what I think good Bible study will do. It not only tells you what the answer is, but, but it goes deeper in the text and says, let's find out not just what the answer is, the short answer, but how do we do this, right? He says, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Point number one, you want to be a person who is not troubled, even though you're being persecuted for righteousness sake, you can still be happy. Why? Wow. He says, because you have the Lord God in your heart. You know where anxiety comes from? Where your worry comes from? It comes from here, folks. And the sad thing is we allow that to come in and we allow it to stay. And that's what's not good for us. When we allow worry and anxiety and, and struggles in our heart, it causes us to fear. So it says here, sanctify, which means to set apart or put God in here and put him in a special position. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks for the reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, verse 16, that when they defame you as an evildoer, or who, those who revile your good conduct in Christ Jesus, may be ashamed. For it is better, verse 17, if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good, than suffer for doing evil. What we learn here is. We're not going to live in this world without evil. We're naive, we're foolish if we think that we're going to be able to live here and evil's not going to exist. And I think that sometimes Christians can be quite naive. We assume because we're Christians and we live in a country, a God-fearing country, you know. I come from what they call the Bible Belt. You know, a lot of people are believers in God. And we just assume... Evil's not going to be should be around here. We're almost shocked that there's evil, right? You hear about religious people behaving like the way they shouldn't. And it shocks us, but really it shouldn't shock us when we realize that, you know, we are spirit, but we're also flesh. And the flesh causes fear. And Satan uses that fear against God's people as well as against his own people. Mm -hmm. So he says here is, it's better for you to suffer when you're doing right than to suffer doing evil. Do you think evil people don't have anxiety? Do you think wicked people don't have troubles? That they don't have any fear? That's part of the reason that they are so awful, is they're driven by fear. They're going to kill you before you kill them, you know, kind of thing. They're afraid just like we're. The only difference is their God is Satan, but God's going to be God. So we're going to live in a world with anxiety. In fact, a little bit later, we're going to look at four. And we'll get there where he talks about the fear and anxiety and how it will ruin us. And also he gives us a solution of how we can become okay. So we see here again, he said, this is the way it's going to be. He says, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer for righteousness sake. But he says, you can be blessed. Don't be afraid of their threats, verse 14. And what you need to do is focus on God. Set God at the forefront of your mind, or you might say, in the middle of your heart. That's how you're going to be able to learn to deal with the fear and the anxiety. That's the only solution. He says, God's the solution. So we have the other passage. Jesus said, you're not above me. I'm the master. You're the disciples. Follow me. Do what I say. I can get you through this, right? So does the God and the Father also teaches that as well here in first, in first Peter 3. Uh, you know, the passage of Revelation, this is the time when the church, the New Testament Christians were really uh, exposed to a lot of things that were dangerous and threatening to them. I many times thank God that I don't live in the time frame of the 
first 200 years after Christ came. Uh, you remember the horrible things that happened to the Christians in Rome and in the Roman Empire, and how they were burned at the stake, how they were beaten, torn apart by wild beasts, just because they believed in Jesus. Can you imagine being a follower of Christ, having that threat over your head on a daily basis? Every time you walk down to the market, how do you know you're going to make it there safely? And back home, or would you be arrested? Would you be dragged to, down to the Colosseum? I mean, I think about that. Think, Could I make it? You know, how did they make it? Well, Revelation chapter two, chapters two and three, he's talking to the various churches of Asia, the seven churches of Asia. You can read about it, and you can read where the Christians didn't always do anything right. I find that encouraging too. You know, but what he says here in chapter two, verse ten, I think is very encouraging for us in discussing this idea of fear. He says. Do not fear. I mean, he says more than that, but I want you to stop right there. <clears throat> what if I got fear? What if I have anxiety? What's God's will for me? He says, Sarah, don't do it. Now, I know you're probably going to say, well, that's easier said than done. <laughs> and then, yeah, I would say amen to that. It is. It's harder to do, but God says, do not fear. Now, how can I live that and believe that? Without God. You can't. The only way human beings can learn to live in this world, and God allows wickedness to have rule like it is, he says, your responsibility isn't to eradicate the bad people. That's all he said. Do not fear because I want you to you know, all get arms and go, you know, annihilate all the wicked people in the world. <laughs> he says, don't fear. <laughs> And he says, I don't want you to fear what you're about to suffer. God even knew that these Christians were living in a difficult time and the suffering would be continuing for a while longer. Right? So he says, don't fear. I know he knew what they're going to go through. They did it yet. But he knew. And God's message to them is, okay, you're about, you're about to suffer. That's, he says, don't worry about it. Don't fear. He says, behold, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison. And, and, and why would God allow that? Not that, that you may be tested. I'm not going to stop. This is tough. We accept, but it's true. Is we don't know how strong we are until we're what? Until we're tested. It's I mean, this is, it may come like, I may be coming across like a lecture here, but I, this could be an open discussion. I, I'm okay with that. Like a Bible study. So um, you can respond, but you don't have to respond. I, I ask lots of questions when I preach. So, yeah. He said that you will be tested for 10 days. Now, I don't think it was a literal 10 days, but there was a set time. God said this was going to be reality. You can't have a time frame. It isn't going to be pleasant. During that time, you may end up in prison. You're going to be tested. He says you'll, have, you'll be tested for 10 days. You'll have tribulation for 10 days. Okay, what's his message? Be faithful until then. Well, why is that? That sounds encouraging to me. I read that and think, okay, 10 days, and guess what? I'll zap you out of your eating condition, and I'll put you in this lovely villa, French Revere, the rest of your life. That's not what it does to God's people. No, he says, what I want you to do under that test and under that trial and feeling abused and, and not appreciated, he says, I want you to be faithful. Faithful to who? Faithful to the one who has the ability to kill body and soul and health. But see, if we're faithful to the one who has that ability, what are you going to get? And he tells you. He says, I'm going to give you a crown. And I would love to contrast this idea. Crown of life versus death. Both words are the same verse. He, two things that we as human beings understand. We understand what life is about. Especially if you're a parent. That new little child comes in the world and you hold that life. I just remember my mother was when she was born. It was like, I thought I knew what it was going to be like, you know? And until it was real, and the doctors, the nurse handed Erica over it, and she was, and it was like, whoa, right? A sensation that you just can't describe. And I think it is, you understood this is what life is about. It's bizarre, you know, the way I decided how we we're going to appropriate and have children. And in my mind, I still just think that this is the funniest thing that we do this, and then. This happens, you know, out of that, you know. Life and death, you know. And I think about that too, even in the spiritual realm. What's God tells in John 3? 
if we want to do, go to heaven, if we want to be a part of the kingdom of God, he says you must be what? Born again. He pulls in this, this idea of, of life, right? Born again. Of course, then you, and you come to Romans 6 with that. We're buried with Christ. We buried. No, we buried dead. Right? You should. Right? You're buried with Christ in baptism. And he says you're raised to walk in what? Newness of life. So it's amazing how often as you read through the Bible, you'll have the concept of death and life in the same context. So God's wanting us to understand this. That this is what it's all about. God didn't put me here to live forever. But he put me here to be tested. And if I choose to put my faith and my faithfulness in him, even if it was going to require that I, my life is taken away, I mean, we could use this verse in different ways. A lot of times we use it, I think, and it's kind of not really the way it was written. It meant literal death. Because these people were being thrown in prison, and they were being tricked. But we all talk about, well, you got to be faithful to death today. That means you got to come to church the rest of your life. You know, that, that's really not what being faithful to the Lord is. That might be part of it. That might be the, 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 the result of your faith in God. When the saints gather, but... I don't think that's really what he's talking about. It's perfect church attendance here. He's talking about in this condition, do not fear. Right? I'm not going to fear, even though he says, Terrible, you're going to experience some things that are not easy to deal with. You're going to be tempted, you're going to be tested, you're going to be thrown in prison. But he says, it's not going to be forever. So whether we're talking about my lifespan in those 10 days, or whether it's half of my years that God gives me to live I would say we're right here telling me to be 100. So we'll see. I like, uh, what is it, 34 years, I guess. 34 years. Because I'm like, just when you think about eternity. So when I get <laughs> so, I'm being fearful and scared of things, I just need to sit down and say, okay, that's carnal fear. I'm not going to let this carnal fear steer my life, mess my life. I'm going to put my trust in God, not going to fear what men may do to me, right? Because I'm going to be faithful to the one that provides it. Let's talk about that. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians 4. Cheryl? Yes. Can I just make one comment for a yes. and, and it's really kind of a carnal example, but. Uh, you know, I'm prior military, and I've, I've known and interviewed and got to know a number of people that were in really hard times, people shooting at you right. outside. And, of course, they're fearful when they shoot. And you ask them, well, how do you hold up in here? And, and over and over, they'll tell you, I just assumed that I was going to die, that I was never going to get out of this. And once I assumed I'm a dead man walking, they say, I have this peace that I'm no longer afraid. Now, they did it from a carnal standpoint right. of just recognizing they're probably going to die. But the application is still true for us. If, if we can face that mortality without, without fear because we're Christians and we have the peace and the promises of God, then your life becomes alive, more alive, and you're, you don't fear somebody slamming you verbally or criticizing you for your faith or speaking out as whatever, school board or whatever. Because if you can face the death, anything short of that is relatively insig insignificant. So that's just it's, it's point. And and then I would just close with this. If we, particularly those of us who are older, I mean Joe May you know that I've lived in nine decades. We tell the rest of it. But, but that's not something we we often face, you know, in our in our younger days. And you, it's not to dwell on, it, but it is to have in the back of your mind that today could be the last day, and that we're not guaranteed the future. And then once you face that and you're at peace with it, your life becomes a wide open. Uh, and then finally, if we if we're not ready to die, then we're not ready, really ready to to live in fruitful. When we get to Philippians 4, it really underlines what you just said. I love that you brought that in and use that example. He connects peace. Yeah. Peace is so important with the uh, an, an, annihilation of fear. 
And um, it talks about the peace of God, which passes what? All of us. understand. As long as we allow our understanding to be guided by the flesh, you'll never get it. It's when you begin to understand God and who he is and what he can do, that he's in charge, then the fear becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And we will find peace, but that peace is the peace of God. The peace that God can provide, nobody else can give it to you. It's God. And that's where we mess up. We often go to somebody else. And I'm not, I'm not knocking doctors. I'm not knocking psychologists. I'm not knocking any type of person that you may go that's smart and, and skilled in some way to either extend your life or to help you with some type of anxiety. I'm a firm believer that we can seek help. But really, the ultimate source of an everlasting peace is to come from. It really does. So, let's go to Time. Keep up time. I'm going to give you some. I'll give you a break. Mm -hmm. What time is it now? But I'm up. See, I'm going my lesson. I'll stop when I think it's good. Five minutes till ten. Five minutes. Take us to Second Corinthians chapter chapter four. Second Corinthians chapter one. Let's look at verse um, thirteen down through verse twenty. Let's get a little bit. He's talking about it. He, he begins in verse verse one of chapter four here. He tells us, "Don't lose heart." In other words, don't get discouraged. Don't let somebody take away your confidence, your positivity. Maybe it's your peace that you have. He says, "Do not lose that." Right. Um, and I love the fact that he balances the potential of losing heart or losing confidence with the introduction of mercy. He said, you've received mercy. Don't lose heart. You know? So again, focusing back on God. Okay? So he begins this chapter with the emphasizing the mercy of God and how that is connected to how we as God's people do not lose heart. Um, he talks about the danger, verse 4, of the God of this age blinding us. There's the influence of Satan, who is the source of evil, right? Blinding the God of this age, verse 4 has blinded people, and when he blinds people, what's the result? They will not really believe in God, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them. The way we overcome is in Christ. And you know all these passages, I'm sure. And we sing a song, Victory in Jesus, one of my favorite ones. Love it. You know, it reminds me that that is where I am going to overcome my fear, my worries, of death, whatever it is. It, I can do that through Christ when we say all things are possible okay. because of God and Christ too. I can do all things through through Christ who strengthens me. We know those passages. We just got to believe in them, folks, and remind ourselves of them. So he says in verse 5, okay, we do not preach ourselves, but we pray, preach Jesus the Lord, right? There's that back to that first passage we looked at. Matthew, in Matthew where Jesus says, you know, you disciples, you're not over your master. I'm the master, you're the disciples, you're the followers, and you need to follow me because I'm the master, right? Anxiety will go away when we truly, totally follow Jesus. And it's hard for us to embrace that. That is the true fact of what the Bible teaches. He says, so we don't preach ourselves, because if, if I could re resolve your worry of death, and I could resolve your worry of salvation and avoiding hell, I'd do it. I'll tell you that, because I'm a very empathetic, I love people. Uh, and, and I want everybody to go okay. I'll be honest. I know everybody's probably not going to make it, but I really do. So if I was in charge of the rules, I'd probably change the rules up, but make it easier for you, you know. But but that's not my right. That's not my prerogative. God's the one who created heaven, and He's going to determine who's going there. So I'm not going to preach myself. I'm going to focus on Christ because Christ is Lord. Verse five. And what do I say when I think about myself in this relationship? I'm going to preach Christ. Well, how do you view yourself, Karen? Well, I view myself, I'm a bond servant for Jesus. So all the wonderful things that I have learned and experienced through getting to know Jesus and embracing Jesus as my Lord and my master, there's good things that's happened to me. In fact, I'll tell you, everything, there's anything, everything good in my life is not because of me. It's because of him. If you can learn to live that, Giving God constantly the glory 
it's going to be so much easier to accept the fact that he's going to help us when things aren't going well. Because he's already shown us all the good that's going on in your life. You know, every every good gift comes from where? From your boss? It comes from your hard work? No. That's a, I think that's the problem with American culture. Is, is we have been driven with this independence and I'm going to make my life and it's all me. Look what I've done. We want God out of it. You want to be around here if it wasn't for God. And he's the one that makes the sun rise and set. And he's the one that makes it possible that we've got oxygen to breathe. I mean, there's so much that we depend totally on God. Yeah, I know God said I need to work hard. God know, told me I need to provide for my family. Yes, I've got some responsibility in this, but I can realize that Take God out of the equation, folks, and none of us will be successful. Even if your hard work, hard work would not benefit you and your family if you had it. We need to realize that. So we don't preach ourselves, we preach our we, we, we preach Christ, and we are view ourselves as servants of Jesus. Picking up then in verse 7, he talks about we are earthen vessels. Okay? That's that carnality. We're fleshly, we're earthen vessels. And, 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 and notice he says, but we have this treasure, this, this knowledge of Jesus. You're a Christian, and you are, God has placed a treasure in you. You're like a treasure chest. But it's, you're, it's a treasure in your flesh, earthly vessel, vessel, for what reason, verse 7? That the excellence of the power may be of God and not ourselves. You there? So the child of God, the father of Jesus, View, we view ourselves as an earthly vessel, but there's this treasure in me, and that treasure in me is God. Christ dwells in me. The Father says he will abide in me if I abide in him. He gives me his, his spirit. His spirit is, is placed in us. That's how he knows you belong to him in the passage that, that talk about. And he says, why, why would God do such a thing? He says that the, the excellence of the power may be of God. And ourselves. Then he goes on, picking up the verse 8, it's, it's, and it's not like these Christians had it easy. Let's learn about these first century Christians. He said, Paul says, we are hard-pressed on every side. And does that describe your daily life? That no matter what you do every day, you're always met with opposition? Hard-pressed on every side. And that's not me. I might be hard-pressed on one side out of six sides of me. But, but these Christians, they were hard-pressed on every side. Now, what would that do to you? What would that do to me if I felt hard-pressed from every side? Anywhere. That's what I was How would that affect you? And I'm going to skip over what he says and go to the next one. And then we'll go back and read it all together. Because I want to see you how they dealt with these troubles. They were hard-pressed on every side. Perplexed. You feel people perplexed today? Well, throw your hands up and say, I don't know, Lord, what in the world I got to do? I tried everything to fix this, and none of it works. You ever feel like it's being perplexed. And then he says persecuted. Now, that's, I, I think basically, I might get squeeze one or two things in under the concept of persecuted because I'm a Christian, but the reality is really is. But persecuted like this first century Christian? No. Nobody's probably taking their life to hear about Jesus Christ. In fact, the people I went to high school with believed in Jesus Christ. Or they may not talk to them. But he, I mean, oh, no. Persecuted folks, at least the way I feel about my life. But these were, they were persecuted. And, and they were struck down. I, nobody has ever struck me down. But, um, but they were struck down. And he says, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our body. Okay? So what we see here is these Christians live under very different circumstances than we do in the good old United States. Even though the good old United States is so good. I think we all agree on that. It's nothing like it used to be. But it's still better than a lot of places in the world, right? And these Christians suffer in that way. So how do they deal with it? Well, those that were Hard pressed on every side, that would eventually get to me, and I think I'd fall to my knees and crush. He says, yet not crushed. So how can you live in this flesh, feeling pressure from every single side and aspect of your life, not be crushed or destroyed? 
He doesn't give us the answer right now, but that these people experienced that life, but they were they didn't let that fear, whatever that was, being pressed on every side, they didn't let that crush them. They were perplexed, yes. But did, how did they allow that perplexity to, uh, to influence them? He says, not in despair. So it wasn't that they were so perplexed they just threw their head on the I give up. I'm quitting. Despair. That's despair. Okay? They were persecuted but never felt what? Never felt forsaken. If you're lost in the woods, I don't know if you've ever been truly, truly lost. I know one person in this room is truly, truly, truly lost. And from what I understand, it was not fun at all. It's scary. But see, if you're truly, truly lost, but you know there's somebody looking for you, do you think that would affect how you deal with the reality that you're lost? And you have no way of knowing how to get back home, no way of knowing how to get out of these woods, but you know somebody's looking for you? I think that would give you hope. You can't get it out here. The idea that they, they were lost, right? But 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 they they didn't allow themselves to go so far that they were in despair. And he goes on to say they were persecuted, but they were never forsaken. Okay? In fact, you have examples of something like that. Well, that's kind of miraculous, but it to me it gives support, it gives it gives me hope. I think of Paul and Silas in prison. Were they forsaken? They probably felt pretty forsaken for a while. But they weren't really. The angel came. <laughs> but isn't it interesting that the angel, when did the angel come? When did the Lord send the angel? Sometime after that they were praying and singing and giving God glory for where they were. And the Bible says, you know, there's angels unaware. You know, so maybe even in your life today, you will be in a place that you feel. Like nobody's thinking about you. Nobody cares about you. Nobody understands you. But realize, even if that's the case, from a physical, carnal point of view, you don't know anybody that is caring about where you are, any human being. He says, but God does not forsake his name. And then struck down, but they were not destroyed. And, and this is, I think, verse 10 is an amazing one. That despite that was their reality, they still carried what with them every day of their life. He says, always, that means every day, always caring about in the body, that's the carnal, that's the flesh, the dying of Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifested. You know what will help you live the life that Christ lived? I mean, we say, Jesus said, follow me, right? All of this, that's what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus. The disciples of Jesus were those who recognized him as Lord and Master, and they, well, wherever he went, they would go. However he thought, they would think. Whatever he, however he reacted to people, we need to do the same way. We react the same way. Well, how are you ever going to do that? He says, the only way you're going to do that is to keep Jesus in your heart. You've got to keep Jesus with you. He says, caring about in the body, in this physical body, Christ dwells, right? That's what it's supposed to be. Paul says, I don't live. I've crucified my flesh, and nothing lives in me. No, that's not what he said. He said, yet Christ lives in me. And you look at the life of Paul, it's amazing what I did. We, 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 I don't know, you've always felt the big hero. It's like, I'll never do it. We just like, it can be okay. The only difference is if you empty yourself of yourself, and you fill yourself with Christ. As Paul said, follow me or be imitators of me as I am what? As I am followers of Christ. Um, so there's that passage again, talking about how New Testament Christians dealt with fear and, and the word anxiety. I'd like to also pivot out into this concept of anxiety because I that that's a lot of, of our challenges as a believer today in the society that we're living in because we really don't, we're not really yet suffering persecution and that type of fear of people killing us. That anxiety and anxiousness, and that's just the idea of experiencing worry, an uneasiness, a nervousness, a fearfulness, and I have to have him to. And the Bible, I think, gives a great definition. I'll give this definition and we're going to take a some break. We'll come back and we'll look at Philippians chapter 4. But basically, anxiousness means you've got a divided mind. That's what it means. 
if you go back to the Greek and study it and look at it and apply it, and, and uh, unfortunately the, the typing wasn't so good right here, I apologize. But basically, what do we mean by a divided mind? A divided mind is, is a mind that cannot stay focused on God. And of course, this is in a spiritual sense. We're talking about spiritual anxiety. It's when we cannot keep our mind focused on God and what it is, it's distracted. It's distracted, so we focus on something else. Whether it be the problem that you're dealing with, you know, it's hard to keep your mind off the problem. Well, God says, don't focus on the problem. Focus on me. Well, why does God want me to focus on him and not on the problem? I think we know what the answer is, right? It's because he's got the solution. Solution, folks. Solution. So I don't want to divide the mind because the divided mind as a Christian is not going to be a pleasant number one. It'll be a very hip hop kind of up. one day you're great and one next day you're off. One day you're great. I mean, it's like that. You, you, who likes to live in that type of situation? If, if, if this happens, if we have a divided mind, what happens? It happens that you are thinking constantly and you have a carnal mind. And I'm going to ask a question. Can you think of any passage where God tells us not to have a carnal mind? And what group of Christians do we know that lived in a world that was very carnal? And that would be the Church of Rome. And Romans talk about the carnal mind. God, Paul said, I want to write to you that still children, but your minds are too old. Your minds are too carnal. So God even addresses the New Testament, tells us that even his people struggle with this. And I think the church does itself, or religious people does, do themselves an injustice by just kind of ignoring this and saying, oh, no, no, I don't have any I don't have any fear. Yes. I mean, the first century Christians did, and it's addressed as much as it is in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament, and, and it, is, it is a danger. A divided mind is not good because a divided mind is going to keep us out of heaven. It really will. So we'll stop there. We'll take us a break. Maybe, I don't know, 10 minutes break or something like that. Whatever you okay. want. Okay, we'll go back. So well, let's open our Bible to Philippians chapter 4. This is when it starts getting good, I think. It gets more optimistic. We've been looking a lot on this idea of fear, and there's a lot more that we could have looked upon it. It's the idea of fear. Um, but like I said, I, I wanted to pivot more from this fear of being killed or martyred or, you know, something, the, uh, the extreme fear. To a, a, a kind of a, I don't know, a softer type of fear, but it's one that's, that I think that everyone struggles with. You may never be faced with, you know, believe in Christ or, you, or your head will be chopped off. I hope and pray we none of us, but most likely we will in our lifetime. But but you will struggle with anxiety, and anxiety is a type of fear. And so we look at Philippians chapter four, and it is the word is found there. It says, "Do not be anxious." About anything. Um, we were studying people who really didn't know God, didn't know much about the Bible. And when I we, we, eventually you'll come across this passage in your studies, and I remember people just sitting there looking at me and they said, That's impossible. That is absolutely ridiculous. There's no way I can be a Christian if that's not. And, and I think. You know, that shows somebody who really, whose heart was really open to the words of God. Because when you open your heart to the words of God, they will do an impact on you. I, mean, I think sometimes we as Christians, we want to read a lot of passages. I sometimes think we don't slow down and just read one, two, and meditate on that. Come on, say. This is funny passage that I, I have to go back and do this for my own self often. And it says, be anxious about nothing. Or some translations say, for nothing. So beginning in verse um, 6, we'll start our reading. If you've got a Bible, please follow along. Um, jump, if we do jump back to verse 1, you see he's writing to the Christians. He, talk, he calls them beloved. He says, my beloved and longed for brethren. He describes his brethren as his joy and his crown. And I don't know about you, so that to me would say that when Christians get together, it should always be joy. I've been to so many churches that at least I haven't seen. Uh, and it didn't seem like joy was encouraged. It seemed to be like it was suppressed. And I'm not saying we're way back crazy, but there should be a sense of joy when God's people gather. And so he's writing to his brethren. He says, you are beloved 
and you are longed for, and, and you're my joy, and you're my crown. And he, what is his message to these people? He says, I want you to stand fast in the Lord. So we looked at the first part of today's lesson is, okay, we do experience fear, carnal fear, fleshly fear, and the solution is to lean on the Lord, to hold on to the Lord, turn it over to God. God's the one who can help you with your fear, and he kind of says that here. Stand fast in the Lord, beloved. He does indicate here that there's two people that don't get along in the church, so sometimes that's the reality. Sometimes we have congregations of God's people that don't get along. And so what's, what's God's message to that? In fact, maybe we might even fear. You all are start trying to get a group of Christians together, right? You want it to grow more than when you have now, and as it grows, guess what happens? There's a potential for more trouble and more trouble and more trouble because everybody is not skilled in the Bible. Everybody doesn't understand everything alike. And there's greater opportunities, opportunities for disagreement. And disagreement is a problem. And God doesn't want us to be disagreed, right? He says, I implore Erona and, and Sinchus to be of the same mind. And listen here. How in the world can you get two women that don't get along to get along? Hmm? I don't have any miracle drug, I promise. But the Lord's got the answer. He says, in the Lord. If we both have if two women, or two men for that matter, if we both agree that our unity is in Christ, not in what Terrell thinks about Christ, or what Terrell interprets what Jesus said in this verse, it is in Christ. And so he says, he implored this, these, these groups of Christians here in Philippi to, to help these women get along, to be in the same mind. And he goes on verse 3, I urge you also, true companion, Help these women. And notice what these women, these are just anybody, old crack, can, can, can tank with little old wid widows or, or, or um, spinsters, <laughs> or two married women for that matter. He says, help these women who labored with me in the gospel. Think about that. These are two women who were involved in the work that Paul did as an, an apostle and as an evangelist. So these women, their faith must have been pretty important. Right? They were involved in spreading the gospel, and you'd think that they would get along, but they didn't, unfortunately. And he says, so they need to be of the same mind, and he says, you need to help these women uh, that, so that they can be of the same mind. And he talks about them, he says, he, he, and he sends greetings, and he talks, says that actually their names are still in the life. Verse 3. There's that mercy of God, you know. But anyway, Score. Rejoice in the Lord. And, and, and as we look through this, notice how many times you find the word Lord mentioned in this chapter or a reference to being. Okay. Again, think about it. Here's my fear. Here's my carnal mind. What's the solution? God. The Lord. It's always, it's always over there. It's not that you can find a solution in yourself. Go to enough psychologists and they'll give you the answer to your No, I mean, they can help you. So figure out some things, unravel some things. But the true answer, the long-lasting answer is in the Lord. He says, rejoice in the Lord, not once in a while, always. Again, when I struggle, the older I get, I get a little bit more direct. When God's people meet and you sense nothing, don't you? I struggle with that because God tells us we should rejoice always. Always. Right? Rejoice in the Lord. And again, Say rejoice. He says, Let your gentleness be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Again, reference to the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. The Lord is at hand. These women need to be the same mind in the Lord. I mean, you see that this pattern going on. He says, Be anxious. Verse 6, we've got up here. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Stop right there. Why would I do that? Why would I bother? Or would God even care? Does God even care about little me? That's what I think about sometimes. I am literally a little man, right? So what God, would he really care about me? I'm not a big fan whatever. I want to be, but it, you know, it was my lot in life. So why would God care? What would your answer be to that? Why, do, why, why, why does God care about you? Your living soul, 
Who gave you your son? Made in the image of God. He created likeness. And the Bible tells us that God is long what? Long suffering, not willing, maybe what? Any should I'm in that group. That's me. I'm one of those any people, you know. No name, insignificant. I'm in the mass. And God wants the whole mass of humanity to be saved. And that's important for you all to understand as you try to share Christ and grow your spiritual family in this location. It doesn't matter what they look like, it doesn't matter how old they are, how young they are, how rich or how poor. God, if it's a soul that walks in the door that needs Christ, that's who God is like. He, that, he's being long suffering. And guess what we need to do? Long suffering as well. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I think we uh, don't fully understand God walks. See, that's a part of God, he's deity. But he could have made humans in any form with a free will or, or just his own thoughts, but apparently he really wants us to exercise that choice and free will and be a part of his family. And, and as, as a forerunner of that, he selected Abraham and his family. And one of the reasons was because Abraham was teaching his generations of, of, about the Holy and keeping the idea of God alive. But, but uh, that, that's an important thing, that, that God wants to be you know, our father and Jesus wants to be our brother. Uh, that's a big part of it. And that's hard for us to really wrap our brains around. Yeah. Why would God? Because of the majesty of the yes, idea. The greatness of God. And, that, and I think that's very important that we do elevate the greatness of God. In one way, the separation, but at the same time, there's not a separation. And that's hard, I think, for us to understand. Because normally, you know, you either have people who want to be with you, you have people who don't want to be with you. You know, people who don't want to be with you, they don't want to be with you. And they have their reasons. And God really has a reason not for us. Because we choose to live a life of what? Sin, most often. Right? We go against his will. We, we, we sadden him over and over again. And he still is there with his hand reached out. So here, the idea of, and I think that's what we see here. It doesn't matter who you are. God wants you to turn to him. When I am anxious, no matter what it is, and I, I like that. He says, be anxious for, uh, don't be anxious about anything. So that tells me that we're all not going to be anxious about the same thing. This group of, the source of anxiety is huge. It's enormous. And things that you're anxious about, I'm not anxious about. Right? But there's things I'm anxious about that they can't. And I think that's why it's so generic. Don't be anxious about anything, God said. It's not just the big things. It can be the little things, right? Insignificant things. Sometimes people make fun of the stuff that you're worried about. In fact, that's probably causing you to not be Because you think, oh, they'll judge me for that. That makes it that's it. But he says, no. In every situation, situations are things that are connected to the flesh. Your relationships, the situations we get into, whether it be a, a family relationship, a a, a work relationship, a, a citizen country relationship. Those are all situations you find yourself in. Situation at work, situation at, if, and you go on vacation, you're in a, you're, 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 you're in a plane. Okay? Is anybody here? No, you're not doing it. Have any anxiety when you get on that plane? And this huge thing that weighs when you read the details of how big it is, and how many tons it weighs, and they're going to put you up in the air. And it's got this thing to stay up there. So I get it, you know. That, that's the situation that can cause me to be anxious. He says the solution is me. By prayer and petition, request, but along with thanksgiving, present these things. Let God know. So, and I think we don't need that lesson today, but really, unless we really know God, you're going to struggle with it. And the better that you get to know God on a very personal level, and I believe that's through this, this is how you read the mind of God, but I do like to talk about being personally involved with Him. You know, and the greater you can be personally involved with Him, knowing what He, he is like, what He is capable of doing, the greater trust that you'll have in Him. If you have a mom a lot of money, who can do anything? My mother is superwoman ten times. 
She's about my size, but I'm not going to do anything. She can't do it. You know, she can plumb, she can like, she can dress up like a beauty pageant, she played basketball, she played music, she she I mean she was a good Christian woman, she'll do anything for anybody, she never meets a stranger. I mean, she's my mother. She I when I was a little kid on the farm, she was a farm girl, uh, uh this sow had a bunch of piglets, and she got up and she was excited about the slop that I was doing, and she stepped on two of the piglets, ripped their bellies open. My mother ran out of the house, got fishing line. And, and a needle and stowed those things up. My mother's not a dad. My mother's not a dad. But she did that. You know, she worked with the butcher. She worked. I mean, my mother just is just a. Well, for me, is amazing, right? And that's why I know I can go to mom, and she's got a solution. And it's because I have gotten to know who she is, how she thinks, how she feels, and so I have a lot of trust. I can lean on her for a lot of things. You know what? She's over here. To God. God gave you ten times more than my mom. And you probably have something like that in your life that seems to be always to can solve things and, and, and figure things out and how much we value and appreciate them. Well, that's who God is. God, anything that I'm worried about, I'm anxious for. People let us down. And that's why he says, Don't put your trust in humans, put your trust in me. And he says, and, and if you do this, he gives you a guarantee in this verse. And when this is back to the good brother here talked about the peace that those mills are against. He says, and the peace of God, which goes beyond, transcends all comprehension, all understanding. He says, it, that will guard your hearts and your minds. Where does anxiety get you? The heart. The mind. So if we can have something to Surround our heart, protect the guard. I love that. I'm very visual as a human being. And when I read this, I see a city, those hilltop cities like in, in, in Italy, and they always had a great big wall around. Why was that wall there? It was to protect. Right? Protection for everyone that resided in it, the wall city. And he says, that's what the peace of God, the peace of God will surround us. It doesn't matter what somebody has done to you, said about you, uh, Whatever you've experienced as a human being, he says, the solution to that, yes, it causes anxiety, it causes worry, it causes frustration, it causes fear and uncertainty. He says, you tell me about it. And he says, this is what I'll do for you. I will provide a peace within yourself that goes beyond, transcends all understanding, and that will result, that will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Again, Notice the in, in the Lord, multiple times, in Christ Jesus, here as well. So, so that is going to be the solution. So what we're seeing here is we end up having a something that's called a, a spiritual fear, which is a godly fear. Um, and I think that's what Philippians here is talking about. I have a godly fear. I have a belief, but also a fear in God. What is godly fear, and how is that so different for spiritual fear? How is that different from carnal fear? Well, carnal fear, our spiritual fear and fear, or godly fear is defined as is, 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 is the, what causes you to hallow, to, to elevate, to respect greatly, to esteem or honor. So those who have godly fear doesn't mean that I'm just shaking into my boots and I can never talk to God. Because he just told me I need to talk to him. No matter what I'm about, whatever it's about me, he says, you come to me. You come to me. See, God doesn't necessarily want to be viewed by his people, by his children, as he's going to spank me. Uh, my lovely, lovely mother I just told you about, I scared her to death. She could spank me. Nobody else could spank me. She had no slowness to spank me. There was no such thing as long suffering to spank me. It was the number one solution to everything. But anyway, so I had a, almost a godly fear for my mother. But anyway, to respect greatly is, is what that means. And that's what we need to have. I want to have not a fear of the Lord in the sense that I focus on the bad that he could do to me. Because he could if he wanted to. So when we take God, take on his heart, right? If we take God into our heart and we take on his heart, we will love the way that he loves. And we'll hate what he hates. That's what godly fear is all about. Godly fear is learning to be like God. Okay? To think like God, to feel like God, to react like God. 
And God is good, right? God is love. You think of all those lovely terms you see, you know, on the back of people's cars, bumper stickers, or hanging on the walls, and lots of things are great. God is love. God is good. God does care, right? There is an aspect that he does say he one day will judge, but rather than focusing on that type of concept, we want to focus on what I call godly fear, a fear of hallowing God, a respect greatly for who he is, and I respect him so much I want to become like okay. Sons, I think a lot of times, born in this world, yeah. their number one goal is to be my dad. At least if he's a good guy, which hopefully that's what they want to be, right? And then the type of fear, type of respect, you know. And, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about a godly fear. Uh, we should be moved by our reverence for who God is. Uh, that we want to fear God and not fear carnally, right? So, who is God? Right? And just briefly, when I think about God, I think about something that's majestic. I think of something that's very pure. I think of something that's all powerful. And there's other attributes. Love, light, suffering, but really, I mean, when I think about God, I think of something that's magnificent, enormous, something that speaks this whole world into existence. I'm thinking that's the person who tells me, Sarah, are you worried about something? Just talk to me about it. And you'll do that if you view God this way. If you don't believe God has all power, then why would you tell him your problems? If you didn't think God has a solution to everybody's problems, you would talk to him, right? I mean, we do that with who do you go to when you've got a problem? Your closest friend, girlfriend, boyfriend, I mean, no, guy friend, I guess I should say. You know, you go to someone that you know understands you, right? And listens to you and will do anything for you. That's who God is. And that's who we need to establish a relationship for. Only people in God should triumph and override any carnal fear or anything. And that's really the solution. And that's what the Bible talks about. God says to me, you know, lean on me. <laughs> Come unto me, all you that, what did you say, Matthew 11? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll throw some more bricks on that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just, you know, make it worse for you, you know. Suffering's kind of good for people, you know. You can take it, you know. But no, that's, no he says, Jesus said, come unto me. And the ones he tells to come is the ones who see they have a need. They were tired. They were exhausted. Nothing. Okay, now they need. You want to get drained? Anxiety exhausts you. Because you never get rid of it. Right? It's always with you. It's there in the heart, in the mind. And that's why he says, the only way you're going to get rid of that me to get involved. So our faith in God and who he is and what he's capable of doing should, could, will help us to triumph and override over those carnal fears and anxiety. We learn to focus on God's power, God's power, God's glory. That's how you overcome. I think that's what Paul was talking about. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If he was to depend on his own ability, his own strength, he's basically saying, I can never make it. But he did make it. He's pretty impressive. He says, I think how do they do this? Because Christ is with Now I know it's real easy to say that, but that is a simple solution to deal with fear and anxiety in the world. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, right? So much now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. This is Paul writing to the Philippian brethren whom he told him to stop worrying. And this is two chapters prior to that. He says, now you need to realize, you need to work out your own salvation. But notice what he says, with fear and trembling, for it is God. See, we focus on the fear and trembling. Ooh, fear and trembling, you know, scare people. Scare people into turning to God. And that's a little bit sense of, he, there's a reason to be fearful for God, because he is majestic and huge and powerful. But what I love about this passage that he follows the fear and trembling with a statement here, and we so stop on this. Yeah, I didn't underline it. Either. For it is God who works in you. That's the line that should be bold and underlined. See, we want this idea of, I think it's the American culture, we literally believe culture influences people's religious perspective. It was in Norway for 20 years. 
That's what a little while is over there. Those people think different, act different, react different, they're so different than we. And, and even religiously. And it is because of their culture, because what uh, what they've been conditioned into thinking. And we can do that in our country as well. Certain things are emphasized in the passage, other things are important. We got to doing that. Everything that God says is important. Yeah? It is God who works in you. That's why Paul says, I can do all things through who? Through Christ who dwells in me. God is in us, folks. We got to acknowledge it and recognize it and lean on it. God who works in me, well, how does he do it? You know, people go, oh, so you're saying you can do miracles. God can you. I'm just saying this with the Bible says me. God who works in me. And what is he going to do? God usually explains it. We stop and read us. And dwell and meditate on it. Well, meditate. Well, what does he mean, God works in you, Terry? Well, he says, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Does that sound like something out of this world miraculous? No, God can influence my will, see, heart, my being, and cause me to become a person who's not going to live selfishly, self centered, pleasing self all the time, but I want to live a life. For the God who wants to work in me, so that I that I will will, I will desire, I will want to do what God knows is best for me. To will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, why would I want to work? Why would I want to work for God's good pleasure? Because he determines for my eternal destiny. My boss. I always try to work hard. I used to do both work. I always work in the work of the Lord. And I was one of those who really tried to please. He'd ask me to scrub the floor, scrub the floor. Tell me to scrub the floor again, scrub it again. I mean, I was there, I was exactly. And even when they were sometimes bosses are cantankerous and difficult. And in fact, we may even be in marriages that are like doesn't seem like one of us to do to get pleasing. We're pleasing mm -hmm. her, you know. And and but yet God teaches us we, we're servants. We're servants of him or we're servants of humanity. He says, I've called you to serve. I've called you to be a boss. And, and I do, I really do, people really know me, I try to be kind and good, and I do it for their good pleasure. Where did you learn that, Sarah? Is that what God wants me? I'm going to please him. And God is all of them, all of that is best for other people. Jesus showed us that. He revealed God to us. So, but I love the fact that he connects the idea of fear and trembling with this idea of doing good. And, 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 and I don't look upon God as this hard, difficult person, but I, I look at God as he's good, his good pleasure. Then I'm going to try to do. God so loved the world that he didn't look. And he's going to be God's son. For what reason? Just for the fun of it? No, then we could be saved. So I want to live a life free of anxiety and worry. Because if we are anxious for stuff, then we don't have time to think about all those people that Jesus died for. Right? Because we're full of ourselves. My family is my worries. My and Jesus, who is the person we say we follow, we even dare, dare call ourselves Christians. Or a church that belongs to Christ, or a church that follows follows Christ, but are we really following? Are we really reflecting the essence of who Jesus was? He had no house. I understand it was so. He had no place to lay his head, but he sure did a lot of good work for other people too. So I think that helps us also. When we pull ourselves away from all this physical, where fear comes from, and focus on the spiritual and the will of God, that also will help you overcome whatever fears you have, because you're so busy doing His will that all this other stuff's not going to do. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, he says, Therefore, since we receive an unshakable kingdom, you are a part of the family of God if you are in the kingdom of God. God says, I want you to understand something. My kingdom is unshakable. <laughs> And if you do it, look at what you want to do. Look at what I said. Man can do it. Man can do it. 
But for true believers who put their total trust in God and lean on Him 100%, they do that. Nothing you can do. It's an unshakable kingdom. You may belong to an eternal kingdom, right? And He says, when we understand who we are and what we belong to, how will that influence you? Be filled with all gratitude. Okay, now remember, the New Testament was written in a certain time frame, right? So was this a time frame where the, where the church was just growing and at peace and everybody loved the Christians? Mm. No. They're being arrested and persecuted and thrown in jail and killed, right? They believe, they, yeah, you can't wait to take, take your life away. In the human, in the carnal thinking, these people belong to a kingdom that we can destroy. Because I can take your life. No, God says, people realize this. You Hebrew Christians, Christians of a Hebrew background, Jewish background, he says, you got to remember who you are. The kingdom of Israel was brought to an end. The greatness of Israel was brought to an end in biblical sense, right? And Jesus built a new kingdom. And he says, my kingdom is unshakable. It doesn't matter what men does. My kingdom is unshakable. And how does that influence you? How does that affect you? The verse tells you the answer. So since if I truly believe in that, God says, this is how we react. Let us be filled with gratitude and so worship God. And what way are we going to worship God? In a carnal way, in the way that I want. <laughs> Let's take a vote here. What do you want to do here in our worship? No, that's human thinking. I want to worship God acceptably. Well, how do you worship God? With reverence. Yeah, the focus isn't on me. We have the lesson of the modern Christian world. That we come together not to make, you know, I was a great service. I love the this and I love the that. And I'm thinking, are you thinking spiritually or thinking carnal here? That was a great meal, you know. Okay, well, yeah, people got to eat, but that's really not why, you know, it's all about God and a great gratitude for God because He's put us in an unshakable kingdom. An eternal kingdom that lasts forever. We want to, it says, by the word of God, we understand what? The heavens were made. And all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that asks you to let all your worries and anxiety be known unto him. And that's the God that says, I will give you peace. A peace that passes understanding. The same Lord that spoke or breathed the world into existence. Come on, Lord. Can't have that. Oh, we're not going to say. Oh, you got to talk. And tell me, anyway, the time. Come out. They try to leave God. So, so, but anyway, homework. See, Jeremiah starts chapter 41. Read all the way through 43. What you're going to see, I love this, fitting in this. This could be a Bible study time, but anyway. There's, this is an example of God's people living in God. It's the Jews. This is a, in, in a time frame when, when they let the people go back. The Babylonian king is, sets up this guy to be a governor. And, and it's all about that story. And this one guy arises among the Jews and he kills the governor. And the people are afraid. Fear, and fearful for what the king is going to do to them. They don't know this passage. It's been a long time since I've read it. I read it just recently, this lesson. Uh, but anyway, so what you've got here is here's the people of God. Okay, what history do they have? Well, he freed them from the Egyptians, did he? Turn all those plagues, freed them from the most powerful country in the world, put them in Israel, blessed them. Things were going great. I mean, the Jews got to experience the power of God in a way that maybe we won't literally experience in our lifetime. And yet they struggled with fear. And that just blows my mind that they struggled so much. With fear, fearing other people. And what we have here basically is after this governor was killed, people are panicking. And so another guy replies and says, What we need to do here is we need to run to Egypt. I can tell you, anybody knows the Old Testament language, Old Testament and what's the New Testament? You don't want to run to Egypt. That's always a trouble for God's people. When they seek help from worldly nations, they don't work. But anyway, read that story, like I say, begin about chapter 40, if you can, 40, 41, 42, 43. And, and, and as you read it, think about today's lesson, the idea of, of here is God's people 
who are living in fear, a carnal fear, says should. And, and notice what it causes. It causes them to make bad decisions over and over and over again. So I just wanted us to end kind of with that to show that, okay, I'm not going to beat on you and say, okay, give me an example of you living in fear that would make you look bad. No. But if we're all honest, we, we're just like these people. Sometimes we know what God has done, but we don't focus on that. We focus on everything else, and we let that <clears throat> our own thought says cause us to choose something that is the worst thing for the So anyway, that's that's some, that's so that's your homework if you want some homework. And um, so the last part is, you know, are you willing to go on that journey of self evaluation? Read the story and see if you can find yourself. In it. Hopefully you can. Hopefully you, you can say, oh, these people are nothing. I think in all honesty, you're going to find your own. And uh, God does have a solution. He's not going to do it. God tells them, don't go. But they go ahead and do it. Yeah. So, anyway. so humanity, we, we really haven't, haven't uh, changed. So hopefully the idea, we, we end with this concept that don't let that fear overcome you. Don't let worry or anxiety overcome you. There is hope. There is a positive outcome. But you've got to realize it doesn't rest really within yourself. You're going to need God to do it. You really are. And, uh, and God promises to help us. So believe in his promises. Believe in his trust. Or trust in him for who he is. And hopefully that your life will become better. Thank you so much for, for y'all's kind attention to that. Yeah. Quick comment. Uh, just from a car standpoint, I can vouch and, and it's even been said statistically, over 85 to 90 percent of things that people worry about on a day to day basis never happen. Some of the worst things in my life never actually happened. And I would give an example Y2K. Now, some of these younger people will never know. But the country and the world in frenzy coming up to the year two. And just very quickly, I heard one of the best lawyers in Burns talk about 35, 40 minutes on what he was doing. He was he was selling out all of his investments, changing everything to dollars, and bought 18 uh, acres out in the country, put two mobile homes out there for 18 of his family members. And was his plan what and all guns all in the with that munition seed because they were going to be raiders and orders. Uh, and then he, he was going to use cash to buy up all the land that people were going to forfeit. Oh, oh yeah. good. And I sat there and listened to that 45 minutes on that long drive home. I said, you know what? If that happens, there's not a thing I can do about it. I did go get $100 on the AT. <laughs> Biggest uh, national worry, worry, and people just freak out about it. And of course, it never happens. Well, thank you. Yeah. The yeah. one thing is, uh, to our, I mean, not only politicians, but the, the whole thing, they always have to try to set up a situation. Remember the time when you were supposed to wrap your house in plastic? Everybody's supposed to, uh, and I'll just say this, not bragging or anything like that, but it just, Came out of me, my, my sister was doing this in the rapid garage and living there. Of course, we realized after a while it wouldn't be able to breathe. And she said, What's your plan? I said, Well, I'm planning to go to heaven. And that's what it just came out of me in a minute. And that's that's what I think is really the solution. Well, I can remember when we were younger, too. We and we were young. My parents made it. Was <laughs> It's <laughs> real. I mean, if it wow, when we're in it, but it's the challenge we're in the world, but we're not a. Well, that's one thing that you said, though, that really stands out to me. Because at times you're afraid, and I would have been afraid to share your anxiety because it seems stupid to other people. And you don't want, you know, what is serious to you to be trampled on by others. But my biggest fear is still my biggest fear. 
church found they were legalized. Then Paul would write that this is we all died. Like if we pay every hour. Is to be in the truest sense. That even though you're in one way you're total strange, you have totally different backgrounds, but what you have together is you're in Christ, you are a family, and that you love each other and you share openly. I mean, tell the Bible says confess your fault one for another. And it's not just fault. Being anxious, I wouldn't say that there's a fault. But the idea that there's an honesty, there's an openness among us that we should not fear to share with each other because God has brought us together for each other. So please do, you know, evoke and and, and keep and and, I, and, my, and again, not, don't create this family that you think. Go to the scriptures, let the Bible reveal to you that first century family of God. Acts chapter two, Acts chapter four, Acts chapter six. Read that and take it serious and apply those emotions and that that love and that connection that they had. That's what God wants the church. to not some big building, fancy. I mean, I, I, I'm not against buildings. I'm not against nice buildings. But when that becomes what the church is, because the church is not that, the church is not that. So please do always feel that you can be open and honestly share. And it'll only strengthen the church. And you know what? As bad as our society is going, instability and anxiety, the church can be a refuge for so many people because their families don't care about but you, a total stranger, showing them the love of God, the care of God, that will draw them in. And their soul will be saved by God. So that's what I hope we pray that you are able to to develop here. Be with you. I think you had to you want to say something. Uh, thank you. Uh, even Christians and senators are people who support you. Selling everything they had and going sit on the mountaintop way to the end of time. Right. Right. So they can get a little bit of anxiety out of the place and store everything they had. And the next day, they're like, what are we going to do? Yeah. So the, the nap. Yeah. <laughs> right. The next year. <laughs> See, and, and now, much later, of course, we can kind of, it's comical. But for those people, again, I, I want us to realize that it's very real. it was very real. And, and even though we may not understand their anxiety or share their anxiety, I hope we can we can show a concern. Even And, and sometimes it's ignorance. Sometimes it's lack of knowledge. Uh, a lack of exposure to really maybe they haven't been taught how to trust them. And so, like I say, I, and I'm not against I, I agree with you guys. It is. It's amazing how often people follow something that doesn't pan out. But uh, I think our role in this is to help people to, you know, if your trust is in the right place, then those things, yeah, you may be worried or worried or concerned about them, but it will not control your life. It will cause you to do things that aren't really all that smart. Thank you so much.